In the mountains of Afghanistan, the 10th Mountain Division patrols the highest corners of this troubled country. For six decades, this remarkable division has put fear in the hearts of America's enemies in the world's harshest terrains, revolutionizing winter mountain warfare abroad and winter sports at home. This is their story. Major funding for the last ridge was generously provided by Raymond Farley, honoring the 10th Mountain soldiers who fought and sacrificed for our country. By John Woodward, Edward Van Romer, and the 10th Mountain Division Foundation, preserving the memory of the 10th Mountain Division for future generations. By Gerald Q. Nash, Robert Snell, and the Compton Foundation. And by the following funders. For a complete list of funders, visit www.lastridge.com. The mountains of eastern Afghanistan are a fortress for dangerous Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters. They're a nearly impossible obstacle for the U.S. Army's most deployed military soldiers, the 10th Mountain Division. The 10th Mountain attitude is to uh, bring the fight to the enemy. We have fought in the snow, we have fought at the highest altitudes the American military has ever fought in. Endless patrols seek out the enemy. Dangerous, deadly patrols. Victory seems a long way off. It is clear when you talk to soldiers, young soldiers, that they're part of something that's, that transcends just, just now. That's not lost on the soldiers of the 10th Mountain Division. They are one of the most unique divisions active today. Born out of hard lessons learned when Hitler's vast war machines smashed eastward into Russia in the darkest days of World War II. The real enemy was winter. Unprepared, the Germans were devastated. Staying alive becomes a major consideration for the troops in the field. Mountains and winter, an even deadlier combination. Whoever holds the high ground has the upper hand because it's very difficult to attack uphill. Here in America, they realized that we were very much unprepared if the United States were, were to get into the war and face that type of situation. Specialized mountain troops didn't exist in the U.S. Army. They had no expertise, no special equipment, and no idea where to start. Inspired by the tiny band of Finnish mountain troops who brought invading Soviets to their knees, the dream of a mountain division was born. People like Minnie Dole began to wonder, suppose the Germans or the Russians or someone would invade uh, New England and come in from Canada, would we be able to stop them? Charles Minot Dole was the legendary head of the National Ski Patrol. He brought his vision of mountain troops to an unwilling military dedicated to flatland fighting. Olympic athletes, expert skiers, and climbers rushed to join the ranks. And that began the ski troops. The tenth was brought into action two weeks before our nation was attacked at Pearl Harbor. With the war clearly going badly, the mountain troops became heroes for a very scared American public. And what men they are, everyone a volunteer. Many are world famous skiers and mountain climbers. Many are amateurs and many are greenhorns. Men from the ski slopes of New England, and men from One of the idols was Norwegian ski jumper Torger Tokel, the Babe Ruth of ski jumping. This modest fellow was a living legend who would lead in training and in combat and inspire others to do the same. There had never been such backbreaking training. Camped high in the Colorado mountains, they were exposed to temperatures down to 30 below zero. 
I didn't think under certain conditions that we were put that we could actually survive the cold. Each man hauled 90 pounds of gear at altitudes approaching 13,000 feet. People began to drop out that just couldn't cope with that much elevation gain. No jeeps, no tanks, no trucks, just the men, their skis, and whatever they could carry. I never seen guys this tough and this well conditioned and this uh, determined to make soldiers. Actually, we used to say combat was easier than the training at Camp Hale. If you thought that was tough, then you take this training here, and then when they start firing at you, you, you put this training really to work. But I think we were before our time. With Army procedures and equipment irrelevant or hopelessly outdated, they pioneered critical survival techniques and gear, adding to their enormous backpacks. You know, I never really weighed it, but I know it was damn heavy. It was later on that we knew that it was 90 pounds. Well, I always thought it was pulling me downhill. <laughs> Even one of the tent's expert outdoorsmen, Tap Tapley, who would later lead an outward bound, found it tricky. We were pushed to our limits many times. You learn a lot about yourself. Once you get thrown around and the pack hits the ground first and your skis go up in the air and you just roll until you get the skis back on the ground, you usually roll quite a ways. The vision of such a highly mobile strike force was so ahead of its time that logistics and supplies couldn't keep up. Well, at Camp Hale and later at Camp Swift, uh, we learned to use mules. Many people like myself never learned to love mules, but mule we did learn to use mules for transport. In Europe, Americans were dying. In Washington, it was clear Army commanders had no idea what to do with the division saddled with 90-pound backpacks and 5,000 mules. So there was a tremendous logistical problem. They were so specialized. Overseas commanders looked at the 10th and they said, yeah, it looks like an interesting bunch, but, you know, no thanks. Training continued with extended winter camping maneuvers testing everyone's limits. Blizzards blowing horizontal snow, record low temperatures. There was a growing sense that the war might pass them by. We all thought, are we ever going to be able to put this together and what we were really trained for? We trained and trained and trained and nobody wanted us. In 1943, the Japanese breached America's borders, invading two mountainous islands off the coast of Alaska. Fears of a mainland invasion raged as bloody battles on Atu Island cost 4,000 American casualties. The Army needed specialized soldiers, and the mountain men finally got their chance. Cocky and confident, they were ready to prove themselves. Amidst a literal fog of war, they landed on Kiska. It was just miserable. The wind was blowing, and the fog was hanging in there. The whole mountain looked like it was just a wall right in front of us. But the Japanese had vanished, their 5,000 soldiers withdrawn beneath a cloak of thick fog, defying the Allies' naval blockade. Unaware of the Japanese retreat, things went terribly wrong. We thought we were dealing with the enemy. Certainly would have been different if we'd had a clue that we might be shooting at our own people. That was a, a fiasco. It was very terrifying. There was no, no commands. And so uh, I just stayed where I was and finally the daylight came and things calmed down. Bloodied by friendly fire, 
they feared they would never get another chance to prove themselves. They were sent back to Colorado to train new recruits in the most brutal winter maneuvers yet. Known as D-Series, it was six weeks of mock battles at 13,000 feet with sub-zero temperatures. I know that D-Series was, was terrible in a lot of ways. But it was part of the whole mountain, uh, you know, uh, mystique. And so we took it seriously because we, we thought we were going to need all our experience to survive. When you got to combat, why well, you didn't think anything could be as bad as the D-Series. It was often down to around 35 degrees below zero. My gosh, are we ever going to survive this? <laughs> Of course, we read the news of the battles at Anzio. We knew there were struggles, bloody battles going up the boot. The question that I often asked, why did it take the tent so long to get into combat? There were reports written by the Army, very critical, not only of the officer leadership of the tent, but particularly the fact that we didn't have heavy enough weapons to stand up in combat against the German Army. Training with heavy weapons meant moving to the extreme heat of Texas. As they sweltered, the Allies stormed the beaches of Normandy. In the tents, uh, many soldiers who felt very impatient. They wanted to get in and win this war, finish the job, and get the job done. But by the end of 1944, the Allies were totally bogged down in Italy. They had suffered terribly through 16 months of bloody fighting, trying to take the northernmost Apennine Mountains. It left them no closer to victory, but left Italy in shambles. It's a nasty place to fight. Also, the Germans had amassed a huge artillery batteries around Bologna, and they knew there would be a bloody battle. So the prospect for the offensive the next year was grim. The Germans' defensive winter line extended from sea to sea, 38 miles deep and 180 miles long, controlling all the high ground. It was impossible for the Allied Fifth Army to move forward towards Germany. Italy is essentially a series of ridges. When you take one ridge, then there's another one. And by the time you got to that ridge, the Germans had prepared almost inevitably a brilliant defense. At last, war planners finally had a job only the 10th could do. It was a deadly mission to capture this last invincible line of ridges. Highway 64, tucked deep in this valley, was crucial. With the Germans dug into the mountaintops overlooking it, this narrow winding road became a tenuous lifeline for the 10th. So the 10th looked at it with kind of fresh eyes. In order to be able to move the 5th Army down Route 64, they would have to take Mount Belvedere. But the key to Belvedere was taking Reaver Ridge because that's where the German observers were. So any attempt to attack Mount Belvedere, which was the commanding peak in that area, was, was doomed to failure without taking Reaver Ridge first. Reaver Ridge rose steeply, 2,000 feet from the valley floor. The 10th devised a simple but perfect plan to scale the steep mountain of rock before them. Reaver Ridge had a sheer face uh, facing them. The 10th mountain was down here in the valley. It's a 2,000 foot, very steep cliff. To my knowledge, no one ever tried to take Reaver Ridge before. And if you look at it in the wintertime, you can see why. We looked at it from down below, and we couldn't believe it. <laughs> but we thought we we're being asked to do it, and we're going to do it. The commander of the Reaver Ridge operation, Colonel Henry Hampton, ordered assault teams to map five routes. The most difficult required ropes and pitons. Ironically, the specialized equipment the tent had developed, tested, and trained with sat in a stateside warehouse. The soldiers made do. 
The whole key to the operation was, we're going to do it at night, we're going to do it without any artillery fire to alert the enemy that an attack is coming, and we're going to do it as quickly as possible. As the operation neared, Commanding General George Hayes delivered a remarkable speech to his division, encouraging the troops responsible for capturing Mount Belvedere after Riva Ridge was taken. General Hayes had told us, you just stay in touch with the man ahead of you. Just keep going uphill and we'll all meet at the top. I was really reassured by his quiet sense of confidence. When the sun set on a chilly February 18th, an eerie mist drifted in, and over 700 men converged on Riva Ridge. The rest of the division held their breath, knowing their turn would come the next night on Mount Belvedere. We start up the mountain. We cross the bridge, we're in a single file. And the thing that worried myself was the fact that normally we just had one medic with us. And this time, we've got about five or six medics. And I thought, they're expecting a lot of us to get wounded and killed. We approached the top of the ridge in a fog. We could not see anything, and the snow was about three or four feet deep. We pushed up over the ridge at that last minute. The Germans were still eating breakfast. I think the Germans were very surprised to see the Americans coming up from the side that they had declared unclimbable. All of a sudden, wham, the next thing I remember was I'm facing the other direction down on my hands and knees. I had been hit. The bullet deflected off a harmonica and prayer book in his pocket, saving his life. Now the 10th faced a new set of problems. Knowing German counterattacks were imminent, engineers erected an ingenious tramway to evacuate the wounded and supply ammunition and food. For the next five days, uh, the battle, the ground was in jeopardy, and without that tramway would have been much harder to supply those people. One company, dangerously low on ammunition, called for reinforcements and even artillery on their own position. We were fighting for our lives. Couldn't fall back. Oh, we didn't even think about that. We just thought we were going to hold it. Badly outnumbered, they repeated the call for artillery on their own position in hopes of knocking out the encroaching Germans. You know, artillery fire is deadly. It's almost too close. By the time the battle was over, the Germans lost their critical observation post, and the battle was on for Mount Belvedere and beyond. Back stateside, families clung together, sharing any scrap of news from the front. They would keep track of each other's sons, and they were good support for each other, but it must have been very difficult for them to hear the stories and then wonder what their, all their son is doing. News didn't travel, you know. It took probably two weeks to get information back. Dear Mother, I must admit that I'd never really been homesick until I got over here. There are times now when I get so blue it just hurts to think of home. 
I am living for the day when I can curl up in an easy chair with a good book and an entire pan of hot buttered popcorn. Private First Class Stuart Abbott. In Italy, with Riva Ridge barely held, the 10th dropped their packs and started up Belvedere with unusual attack orders, fixed bayonets and unloaded weapons. I didn't like it and I don't think many of the guys did, but the general knew that if we did fire them, the flash would give away our position and we would be in worse shape than if we didn't do it. For all practical purposes, we were soundless. From the diary of Dan Kennerly. Sometime after midnight, the sound of a burp gun, a German pistol, came from the 3rd Battalion area on our left flank. Now the Germans know we're here. A chill is running up my spine. The 10th was stepping into deadly artillery fire and minefields the Germans had been preparing for months. No one knows, unless you, you're there, the, the, the sound of 88 artillery shells coming in and uh, the, the, the speed and the power and the noise. One of the things you had to do is you had to keep moving forward. You fire at the enemy, but you can't see him because it's black. You stumble over barbed wire, and all you know is that you try to do the things that you're supposed to do, and then the rest is chance. We had to go through a couple of minefields. I hit this trip wire. And so I whispered, you know, mine, mine, mine. And I could hear the click, and nothing happened. Fate intervened. That mine was frozen shut, but the soldiers in his footsteps weren't as lucky. I could hear voices that I knew they were in those minefields. And then when the Germans started lobbing in all that mortar fire, the men began to run. You could recognize, you know, the screams, and that was really uh, unnerving. We suddenly came under tremendous mortar fire. And I looked back down the hill. Everybody was dead or wounded. Well, I think it's been said, and it was true then, that you're pretty brave at the start because you don't know the consequences. Every day that you're in actual combat, you know before you go out that all of you aren't coming back. You just know that. It's just part of the deal. You know that the longer you're there, the more likely you are you may be next. As soldiers struggled up the mountain beyond Belvedere, Hugh Evans took on an entire field of Germans alone in a remarkable burst fueled by the anger of a friend's death. The Germans gave up. They stood up in their holes and surrendered. That whole hill, it was like standing up. And I realized what an idiot I was. This old infantry really gets stuff thrown at it. And don't think we aren't scared. It's over now, though, and it will be just one black spot on my mind. I just keep wondering how many black spots there are going to be before this damn war will be over. Sergeant Hugh Evans. 
Evans was awarded the Silver Star for capturing two machine gun nests, killing five Germans in the process. While soldiers endured chaos on the battlefront, the home front braced for the worst. Dear Mrs. Abbott, this is my first opportunity to offer you my deepest sympathy for the loss of your son, Stuart Abbott. The terrain we had to cover was rough, and the enemy positions good. It was a difficult task. There was no braver or finer man on the hill that day. I sincerely believe that he never knew what struck him. But those who die, die knowing that they will never be forgotten, and they did not die in vain. Sergeant Ben Duke, Jr. The final and crucial assault lay ahead on Mount Della Terraccia. Bloodier than the original attack. One battalion ran out of ammo and was replaced. Amidst fierce counterattacks, another battalion took heavy casualties and eventually the mountain. The Germans threw their most furious counterattack at Mount Della Teresa. Thousands of rounds came in in a short period. Huge artillery bombardments, and uh, our troops barely were able to, were able to uh, withstand that attack. That was a major counterattack, and they really wanted to take that mountain back. And when we finally got to the top, and it was hard fighting all the way, they had a very fierce counterattack, preceded by a fierce artillery barrage. They were extremely intent on holding that position. We didn't realize what an advantage the uh, Germans had until we made it to the top. Oh, there are 36 people in the platoon, and uh, six people made it. When they took Della Teresia, which was the last mountain in the Mount Belvedere complex, my platoon was ordered to go forward and occupy a, a farmhouse out about 300 yards in front of the lines. Lots of Germans, a lot of firing. They wanted our little outpost because it would have been an outpost for them also. It was kind of us versus them, and it was pretty isolated, pretty scary. I think I was 19 years old, and I was the acting platoon leader. We were told to hold it, period. For five days, the Germans tried to drive the 10th from this important position. Instead, the assaulting German mountain troops were driven back with heavy losses. The men were determined. They beat back the counterattack, and that was the end of the German thrust on the Mount Belvedere Ridge. That was the decisive battle that then determined the future of the campaign. The battle was over, and the stage was set for an offensive to reclaim the rest of Italy. Every time that we went to take a hill, we had to go uphill into the enemy fire. But we had one big advantage. We had the artillery back there. Artillery was critical, often the deciding factor. It's interesting to look at the German and American weaponry. The Germans had better armor, better tanks. The artillery was also, I would say, a little bit tilted towards the German side. They had a gun called the 88, and that was originally developed as an anti-aircraft weapon. But it was such a devastating weapon when used as a Drex uh, fire weapon, the Americans learned to really hate and fear the German 88. The 10th defied German firepower their rapid success surprising commanders on both sides. 
the Germans would not be surprised again. They struggled to recapture key roads. Unrelenting shelling reduced towns to rubble. Critical bridges were repeatedly built and blown. We had trouble right away. There was a series of small mountains in a complex uh, terrain. On the very first day, the famous ski trooper, Torger Topol, was killed, and many others were killed in fighting for small towns and small villages. The tenth spread out and pressed forward, always forward, in the first of many long days to come. We came on this little farmhouse and barn. There was a German ammunition cart and a horse in there. And I took a hand grenade and pulled the pin. Just as I approached the door, the door opened and it was, the house was packed with civilians from the town that we were going to take. And I came so close to throwing that hand grenade in there that that's kind of haunted me, to tell you the truth. Just how close I came to killing all those people. As the day wore on, Weaver Ridge's leader, Colonel Hampton, was wounded in Sassamolari, a quaint town whose beauty masked the danger. There was a machine gun in this church steeple, and there's kind of a wall about halfway up that hill. Every once in a while, I'd do the old trick to stick my helmet, you know, up over the wall, and uh, the machine gun would open up, so we were pinned down there for sure. But even as the 10th prevailed, they did so at great cost. So you see, Mother, Daddy, in my short time in combat, my heart has hardened and my soul grown bitter. I have killed and I shall continue to do so without flinching until peace comes to the world or me. I shall destroy whatever the enemy hides behind, but there will always be room in my heart to feel for those that have suffered, still room in my heart for those dreams of romance and legends that have enveloped these foreign lands in days gone by. Yes, I'll destroy and be bitter, but I'll also dream and love. Private First Class Dennis Noonan. As spring unfolded, the Allies planned a massive offensive. This was the big push, setting Italy ablaze from coast to coast. Soldiers knew if they succeeded, the door to Germany was open. Fail, and the war in Italy would never end. The 10th Mountain Division found out the importance of air support. Air support is almost as devastating as artillery fire because it comes out of the sky and you can't run from it. I mean, if you're in the open, you're probably going to get hit. Full air support led the way. On April 14th, reeling from the recent death of beloved President Roosevelt, the 10th attacked enemy positions across the valley on three steep hills, nearly a thousand feet each. It was a furious bombardment that lasted more than an hour. Everyone thought that that would finish the Germans, but when we went forward, we soon discovered that the Germans had just hunkered down and were ready for us. The Germans knew exactly what we were gonna do. Surrounded by hell on earth, 10th soldiers tried to move ahead. The place looked like it was on fire. Just the artillery. How could anybody survive? 
The next thing we know, the machine guns just open up and they're cross firing. I can just remember sort of going up in the air and then coming down and down. And the next time I get up, I'm hit. Wales Kennedy comes over to me and says, Hey, Luke, are you dead? I said, I don't think so. But his ordeal was far from over. We get to a, a command post. Open the door! We bang on the door. They will not let us in because one of the officers in there said, you're going to bleed all over our maps. I think this is probably the most bitter moment I ever had. In the fury of battle, civilians paid the price. Farms destroyed, livestock killed, churches bombed. Dear Eleanor, the mountains are majestic and fierce and snow-covered. There is an appalling contrast to death, injury, noise, fear, cold and hunger. Almost every town in Italy has been destroyed, at least in part. Private First Class, Ken McDonald. We were getting pounded by mortars and artillery. And we finally got to the top and dug in. They had this whole area zeroed in with 88s from the tanks. And they just scream in. Psychologically, they're really, you know, tough to handle. Out of our original 42, there was only 11 of us that came back up. On Hill 909, a vital mission to remove German observers struggled. Quiet and gutsy 20-year-old squad leader John McGrath saw the enemy's machine gun nests and took matters into his own hands. He stepped into one of them and his rifle jammed. So he picked up a German machine gun and went after two or three other machine gun nests. He knocked out about four or five of them. McGrath then went out to get situation reports done his job and he was coming back. The shell came and killed him. John McGrath's courage under fire allowed the hill to be taken and earned him the only Congressional Medal of Honor in the tent. But the Germans still held the high ground nearby the prominent Rocca di Rufino. Amidst intense barrages, the 10th captured the imposing mountain and met their match, the medieval village of Toriusi. Toriusi was a difficult objective because it's a small village of perhaps a dozen houses situated on curving roads in a tangle of hills that are very difficult to attack. The next couple of days, there were furious battles all over the place. They were not giving up by a long shot. The 10th had opened a breach. The Germans couldn't close. The 10th rushed towards the prized Po Valley, rushed toward the Alps, rushed towards Germany. Once we got past the Apennines, it was just a matter of chasing the Germans. It was who could run fastest whether you could run fastest backwards or you could run faster forward, and ended up that you could run faster forward. The German command was in chaos. Rumor had the Germans fleeing to a fabled fortress in the Alps where they could hold out indefinitely. The Germans were planning to get across the Po Valley and get out and uh, get back up into Austria. The Germans were just as dangerous in retreat leaving a deadly trail of destruction to slow the Allies. The 10th was leading the 5th Army. 
so far ahead of the lines at times, they were surrounded by Germans. One or two times I think we were trucked, but most of the time we were marching and we didn't stop until we got right to the river. As the 10th approached the Po River, the Germans headed to the far bank. Then the shelling began. They really pounded us on the south bank of the river where we were waiting for the boats to come up. Certainly it was several hours. Well, if anybody said they weren't scared, they must be in a bank robber or something. Yeah, the Po River is a, is a substantial barrier to cross that river in paddle boats while the enemy is firing at you on the far bank is not an easy task. The Germans didn't expect anybody to come across a river with no bridge, with no ability to have heavy artillery support. We were very much surprised that we're crossing the river right now. My darling, you probably read how our division spearheaded the attack all the way. I was in command of the first platoon in the whole 5th Army to cross the Po. Fourteen men to a boat. Lots of machine gun fire and artillery. Two more days and nights, and we are across the valley into the Alps. Second Lieutenant Bud Phillips. It was a sleepless time. During the next seven days, we got all the way across the Po Valley, marching 80 miles in seven days. To go across the entire Po Valley against opposition was a remarkable achievement. Finally, the invincible German army began to yield. Over 10,000 soldiers surrendered in ever-increasing numbers. Once again headed to the mountains, the 10th was in its element as it struggled to seal off German escape routes. With rugged mountains rising from the shores of Lake Garda, the Germans prepared a fanatic defense using a series of tunnels through the steep slopes. Every approach was treacherous. There was no easy way over them, around them, or through them. As the American soldiers of the 86th Regiment were going through the tunnel, the Germans had a lucky hit with an 88 shell, and there were large numbers of casualties of Americans who were killed and wounded in that tunnel. Earlier that same day, the Germans had tried to blow that tunnel up, but the people who had their demolitions made a mess of the job, and instead they killed their own men and a number of horses. We went through there, the uniforms were smoking still. It was a tunnel that did all right, but it's all German did. Frankly, if it hadn't been them, it would have been us. <laughs> to skirt the deadly tunnels, amphibious trucks known as ducks were brought in. As a storm blew in, a heavily loaded duck capsized and sank. 25 drowned, one survived. That was the most horrible thing I'd saw during the war. I saw them loading them, and I was about the third one. Two more guys had gone, and then I'd have been on and I'd have gone down with them. And we stood there with our mouths open, a lot of guys in tears, because they knew, you know, they knew what had happened and they knew those guys didn't have a prayer. Along Lake Garda's shore, the rich and powerful had long sought refuge. Somebody told our platoon to go down and take over this villa. And it turned out to be Mussolini's northern headquarters. We all took turns sleeping in Mussolini's bed. <laughs> Only days earlier, dictator Benito Mussolini left his lakeside villa, only to be murdered by his countrymen. Hitler's suicide on April 30th left no doubt the war's end was near. But some soldiers from the 10th would not live to see it. A stray bomb left a horrific trail. From the 
diary of Sergeant Harris Dusenberry. We switched back down the mountainside and passed the spot where what was left of the bodies lay. Blood and bits of bone and flesh and shreds of clothing lay scattered over the ground. Along the trail, there was a gunny sack of arms and legs with the grizzly end sticking out. This is the thing that gnaws at your heart, yet in war we have been hardened. Without a tear, we hurried on to get by this awful spot, silently thankful that it had not been our time to die. By May 7, the weary world celebrated victory and peace. All German forces surrendered, their mighty army reduced to stragglers and survivors. As the war came to an end and the German troops were surrendering in northern Italy, many of the uh, enemy wanted to surrender to the 10th Mountain. They declared the end of it, and I thank God. I was so grateful that it was over. We couldn't believe it. it. Took a while for it to sink in. It was an overwhelming feeling, actually. But the tent found itself at the birth of another war, the Cold War, as Yugoslavian strongman Marshal Tito made a dramatic land grab. The United States Great Britain wasn't going to have any part of that. We went there at the beginning of all this, and the Yugos had, had moved in some of that mountainous territory up there. Only a small number of senior commanders realized how close the Allies came to a bloody shooting war with the Yugoslavs. Tito's troops and an assortment of partisans patrolled one bank of the Isonzo River. Allied forces, including the 10th, patrolled the other bank, never knowing what or who to expect. We had those guards, they were, might have been about 12 years old, and they had rifles. So you never quite know what, what in the world they're going to do. There was a real sense that fighting was, po was possible. There were moments there that were kind of very nervous making for the tenth. It was decades before it was clear how the changing balance of power shaped the future. Though the Cold War would escalate for decades, time quickly ran out for the 10th. By mid-July, they were ordered to prepare for a dreaded invasion of Japan's mountains. But the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings and Japan's subsequent surrender changed everything. The 10th went home and stayed home. There was no one division that won World War II for the, for the Allies, but everyone working together as a team created the ultimate victory. The tenth, in a sense, was sitting on the shoulder of a lot of other outfits that had done one hell of a job. When the Tenth Mountain was inserted into battle, it tipped the balance in the Allies' favor in Italy. Their victory came at a cost the 10th suffered one of the highest casualty rates of any division in the Army. After four years of training and just four months in battle, the 10th is without a role and deactivated, only returning years later with new Cold War responsibilities. Post-war, members of the 10th continued to innovate. They put their love of the outdoors and their ski training to work, creating the U.S. ski industry. There was probably not a ski resort in the entire country that wasn't touched in some way by the 10th Mountain Division. What ties together was a love for the outdoors, for the mountains. We were tough. We were disciplined, I think. It's a hard word to use, but we were gentlemen. These were good guys. That two and a half years and my 78 years of being on the earth probably was the most important. 
uh, in terms of finding myself, building very special relationships, and actually doing something that I felt uh, was really vital. I gauged my war experience at the time in feet and seconds. You never knew from second to second what you would survive. The older you get, you realize how important it was in your life. As long as you've survived. <laughs> I was little and I was scared and I was quick and I could duck a bullet. <laughs> Six decades after World War II, the tenth identity is deeply rooted in their character. Under considerably better conditions than 1945, Tenth veterans often return to Italy with their descendants, fostering a mutual affection with the Italians that bridges cultural and generation gaps. Second and third generation now, but they know the stories, they know what was done, and they appreciate the American soldier. You know, we're still called upon on a daily basis to do the near impossible. If you're operating at you know, 9,000 feet in the mountains of Afghanistan, chasing some pretty rugged fighters, being able to go where others don't, pretty important. A spirit also reaches across time and space between original and modern tenth soldiers on the parade ground or in hospital wards. The 10th vets reach out to current soldiers. Just like a, us old timers. The, thing, the stories that they tell us and the wisdom that they give us and the encouragement they give us to uh, keep going, move on no matter what. These guys are the ones that led the way for us. They've kind of paved the way for us. You know, they've shown us the standard that we need to, uh, to live by. Talking with them has made me I think a, a better uh, soldier. I've learned uh, actually quite a bit. Just the fact that even though the two generations are so different, it still boils down to the fact that people are willing to step up to the plate when they're needed. There's nobody else like the 10th Mountain Division. There's no other Mountain Infantry Division. With the heritage, it is a real sense of pride. These boys aren't so different. Better technology than what we had. This was a unique division. There never was one like it before, and there never will be one like it again. A lot of men in the tent are still skiing, still snowshoeing like me. <laughs> and uh, they still love mountains. The mountains keep us young. <laughs> The Last Ridge is available on DVD with additional interviews and bonus scenes. To order, call 1-800-679-0604. You can find out more about the 10th Mountain Division's uphill battles and go behind the scenes by visiting our website at www.lastridge.com. Major funding for The Last Ridge was generously provided by Raymond Farley, honoring the 10th Mountain soldiers who fought and sacrificed for our country. By John Woodward, Edward Van Romer, and the 10th Mountain Division Foundation, preserving the memory of the 10th Mountain Division for future generations. By Gerald Q. Nash, Robert Snell, and the Compton Foundation. And by the following funders.
For a complete list of funders, visit www.lastridge.com.